Tonight, I'm very excited to welcome Jack Goldsmith to Politics and Prose, uh, celebrating his newest work in Huff's Shadow, a stepfather, a disappearance in Detroit, and my search for the truth. There have been many theories about the fate of Jimmy Hoffa, longtime president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, since he disappeared in 75. Many involve Charles Chucky O'Brien, uh, Hoffa's aide and Goldsmith's stepfather. In the compelling account, Goldsmith recounts how his childhood affection for O'Brien became more complicated as he pursued a legal career. Uh, then, when the perspective he gained for serving in, as assistant attorney general under George W. Bush, Goldsmith was moved to uncover the truth about O'Brien, Hoffa, the mob, the waning labor, labor's power, and the rise of the surveillance state. Uh, in Hoffa's shadow tells the moving story of how Goldsmith reunited with the stepfather he disowned and then set out to unravel one of the 20th century's most persistent mysteries and Chucky's role in it. Goldsmith is the Henry L. Shattuck Professor at Harvard Law School, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, uh, headed the Office of Legal Counsel in the George W. Bush administration, which during his tenure, he challenged the warrantless wiretapping program and withdrew two memos written before his tenure, justifying the use of torture in the war against terrorism. He has also authored Terror Presidency as well as Power and Constraint. So please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Jack Goldsmith. So thank you, thank you very much to Politics and Prose for hosting this event. Thanks to you all for coming out tonight, even though there's serious competition with the Democratic debate and a certain baseball team that I know there are many fans for. I'm grateful that you came. So my tale begins in June of 1975 when I was 12 years old. Um, I was living in West Memphis, Arkansas. And um, my mother in June of 1975 married what was her third husband. Uh, his name was Charles Chucky O'Brien. Uh, I did not have a, my birth father was not a terribly good father. My stepfather, the second marriage, was not a great father. So I hadn't really had a great father figure in my life by the time I was 12 years old. And Chucky O'Brien shows up on the scene, and he, they got married in June of 75, and I had known him for about six months before then. And I immediately glommed onto him. And uh, he was an amazing father. He, he showed me the love and affection I'd never had. We did everything together, and I thought he was the greatest. 12 years old. Six months after my mom married him, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared mysteriously from a parking lot in, um, in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, in uh, Bloomfield Hills, outside of a restaurant that was then called the Marcus Red Fox. To this day, there's no direct evidence of what happened to Hoffa. He vanished. There are lots of theories, but no one knows what happens. What happened? He was in the parking lot. He was seen in the parking lot as late as 2.45. And the next thing we know, he had his last phone call at 3.30, and that's it. Uh, there are lots of theories about how he was picked up, but we don't know to this day what happened to Hoffa. Now, who is Jimmy Hoffa? Jimmy Hoffa, as many people in the room may know, was in the 50s and 60s one of the most um, well-known public figures in the country. He uh, led the Teamsters Union, uh, which was the most powerful union in the country at a time when unions mattered. He was, had an outsized personality. He was an extraordinary uh, labor leader for the Teamsters. And he was also corrupt in many ways. Uh, he had many ties to organized crime. He cut side deals all the time. He used the pension fund to line his own pockets. But he was this huge, large figure. And he basically went to jail in 1967 for a variety of things. He was out of jail in 71 uh, when Richard Nixon pardoned him or commuted his sentence, I should say. And he was trying to regain the presidency of the Teamsters when uh, he was disappeared. Uh, probably, almost certainly, at the behest of the mob, who, because basically Hoffa was trying to win back the Teamsters Union, the presidency of the Teamsters Union. The mob had taken over control of the Teamsters Union much more than when he was president, and they didn't want him back. They feared he was going to spill all their secrets about because he was threatening to do so. And pretty good evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, that it was mob organized. There's a lot of evidence of that, but no evidence of what happened that day. One week after the disappearance, Chucky O'Brien became the lead suspect. Chucky O'Brien was also Hoffa's right-hand man 
from the early 50s, basically until he disappeared, until the year before he disappeared. He met Hoffa when he was nine years old, and he was by Hoffa's side basically all the time from the early 50s uh, until he went to prison and then after prison until just before he disappeared. Many people thought that Chucky was Hoffa's illegitimate son because they were so close, uh, and they were just extremely close. They were always together. And so it was quite an extraordinary thing when six days after the disappearance, my stepfather became the leading suspect. Now, for those of you who remember, um, it was a circus. The Hoffa disappearance was a circus. It was front page news every day. It was on the evening news every night for weeks. And it was just uh, an incredible maelstrom. And I was in the middle of it because I was this 12-year-old kid whose step new stepdad, who he revered as the leading suspect. So during the next five years, during my high school years, the formative years of my life, as I look back on it, Chucky was caught up. And he, why was he the leading suspect? To be, to be brief, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that pointed towards him being involved, including that he was in the vicinity at the time of the disappearance. He had had a break with Hoffa six or eight months earlier. He was driving a car uh, that was the car of the son of the leading Detroit mobster who was thought to have organized the hit. Hoffa's hair, was the hair matching Hoffa, was later found in the car, and Hoffa's scent was found in the car. So there was circumstantial evidence pointing to, towards him. The FBI had every reason to focus in on him. So the next five years of my life was basically, uh, there were two or three things going on. One, Chucky and I became like this. I came to revere him. As I said, he was an extraordinary father. I came to revere the Teamsters Union. I came to revere Teamsters Union, uh, his union identity. I came to revere the mobsters that he was close with. You may have heard of Anthony Giacalone and Anthony Provenzano, Tony Pro, a New Jersey mobster. Those were both Uncle Tony to me. I spent a lot of time at their house. I thought they were wonderful gentlemen. And I believed my stepfather when, I, when he told me that the mob really didn't exist. I mean, I just kind of bought the whole thing. This is at the same time that I was hanging out with these folks and that he was my father and we were very close to Hoffa stuff, which is out of control. And the government was all over him. And he was basically painted in the press as the guy who did it. And it's to this day, it's conventional wisdom that Chucky was the person who drove Hoffa to his death. If you type in Chucky O'Brien and Jimmy Hoffa into Google, you will find that that's the person who, who did it, who, who picked Hoffa up. Um, so, I go to college in 1980, and over the next six or seven years, I start to rethink Chucky. When I got to college, I read uh, books about the Hoffa disappearance for the first time, one of which was Dan Baldea's great book, The Hoffa Wars, Dan's in the back there. And it turns out, this may seem naive, but it turns out the mafia did actually exist. It turned out that my uncle Tony, my uncle's Tony were violent guys. It turned out my stepfather was had a criminal past. All things that I kind of either was dimly aware of or didn't focus on when I was in high school. Also, I came to worry that maybe my life would be endangered from being, uh, from hanging out with Chucky, from being his son. I came to when, when I used to revel in his union identity, and I came, to, I used to revel in his making fun of education my values started changing in college and I came to admire them less. And finally, I started thinking about my career, my professional career. I was accepted at Yale Law School and I started to think, maybe it won't be such a great thing to be an attorney, uh, especially if I have any ambitions to be in the government, which I only barely did, to have these very close mob ties and to be the foster son, or excuse me, the stepson of the leading suspect in the Hoffa disappearance. So to make a very long story short, um, I cut Chucky out of my life. And it was a slow process, about five or six years, a gradual process. And I concluded basically by the time I finished in law school that I needed to go on with my life and have nothing to do with him. I had convinced myself at the time that he was a bad person, that I was a virtuous person and needed to stay on a virtuous path, that he had either wronged me or might wrong me. And I built all this up in my mind and I basically cut him out of my life. And it was brutal. And it hurt him quite a lot in ways that I didn't appreciate at the time, and I'll come back to at the end of this talk. Um, so it turned out that this was a, a very good idea from a professional standpoint. The year after I got out of law school, I was clerking for J. Harvey Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, and the first thing he asked me to do was to work on a case that required me to get uh, a classified security clearance, a secret clearance. 
and I filled out the forms, and I, as, as the forms require, I put down all my aliases. I pointed out that I was, my name was Jack O'Brien from the age of 13 to 21. I didn't say Jack O'Brien, comma, the son of the leading suspect in the Hoffa disappearance, <laughs> but I did fill out the forms properly. About a week later, um, three, two or three FBI agents come to Charlottesville, where I was working at the time. I thought it was this, uh, with a standard um, security clearance interview. I didn't know what they were at the time. I later found out through a Privacy Act request that this set off alarm bells inside the FBI, and they thought that you know they had access to someone who was close to the leading suspect in the Hoffa disappearance, and they were going to learn something. So basically, uh, I spent a day with the FBI, and they were basically grilled me for a day. Very unexpected to me. I didn't expect this at all, and I thought I was. I thought I was finished in terms of getting a security clearance about everything I knew about the mob, everything I knew about Chucky, my attitudes towards Chucky and the like. Well, to make a long story short, I convinced them that I didn't have mob values and I convinced them that I had separated myself from Chucky and I got the clearance. And that's kind of a metaphor for the next 20 years of my career. I kept getting the clearance as I got fancier and fancier government jobs. And I did so basically because I tossed Chucky under the bus. It, it was as from a career perspective, it was, uh, it was a, a good move in terms of professional development. Um, so I'm skipping over a lot of things because I, I want to get to what, to the writing of this book and what it's about. It's about what I'm telling you now is how the book opens. Um, so t fast forward 15, 18 years later, I'm working in the Justice Department. I'm the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, a job I never would have had I never would have gotten had I not done what I did to Chucky 20 years earlier. And I'm working in the Justice Department late one night, and I'm working on a program called Stellar Wind, which you may have heard of. It's the warrantless wiretapping program from the Bush administration. And to make another long story short, there are all sorts of problems in the program. And I was just starting to figure it out. And I was in the Justice Department late one night um, reading Fourth Amendment cases. And I'm reading a case called Berger versus New York, which some of you may remember. And I'm reading along... And there are two citations, Hoffa versus United States, O'Brien versus United States. I was kind of shocked. I said, can that possibly be my stepfather? I looked up the case. It turned out it was a case involving Chucky O'Brien. When I was in high school, Chucky had always said how corrupt the government was. They could break every rule in secret. They engaged in illegal surveillance all the time. And they did it to me. And I had a famous Supreme Court case, he told me. I didn't believe him. And I never knew about this case. It turned out that was mostly true, and it turned out he was illegally surveilled in the early 1960s, and it turned out this case did vacate the conviction as part of um, basically um, cleaning up decades of surveillance abuse by the government that finally emerged in the public in the mid-60s, and he was the beneficiary of this because the government actually was illegally surveilling him and his lawyer in the office of a, a, a mob person that he was close to. So this was shocking to me for many reasons. First of all, I was in this very stressful situation involving the President of the United States and warrantless surveillance of the war on terrorism, traumatic. And another traumatic period of my life comes back, and it just came rushing back to me, the things that Chucky said about the Justice Department and how they could cut corners and the like. And there I was, knee-deep in a surveillance program that had serious legal problems, and some Chucky basically in the large was right about the 60s, and it was still true in the large when I was there in the early 2000s. So this began a process for me that took about a year, a process in which I went through a lot of soul-searching about my relationship with Chucky. Um, and it involved a lot of things. It involved me uh, realizing that I had judged him very harshly and that I had not paid sufficient... I had, I had exaggerated my own virtue and, uh, und and uh, underappreciated his virtues, that he had never done anything wrong to me, uh, and he'd only been a great father to me when I was in high school. Um, he was ill, and um, I appreciated his situation of being charged with something bad that he couldn't really fight because I was actually, when I left the government, I was accused of doing things which I didn't think were, were fair, and but I couldn't really fight those charges either, so I sympathized with him on that front. And finally, I had two young children, and um, 
my mom had always told me how badly I hurt Chucky when I broke with him, uh, but I didn't really appreciate it until I had my own children. And when I began to reflect on the, the, the vulnerability and the love I have for my children and the pain that would happen to me if I did to, they did to me what I had done to Chucky, all these reasons came together to lead me to ask for his forgiveness in late 2004. It happened in a very uh, casual way. I was, we were sitting watching Seinfeld, and uh, in a television room, he, w- he wasn't well. He was sitting in his chair, and I turned to him, and I said, I was wrong to do what I did to you 20 years ago. I hope you'll forgive me. And he looked at me, and he was surprised. We, this, is the first, this is the first trip that I'd seen him really with, with any amount of time. We had had a good couple of days together. It was like the good old days. But he was shocked when I said this. And he looked at me, and his face was ashen, and his eyes were hollow, and he started to, to tear up. And he said, you don't have to apologize, son. I understand why you did what you did. And that was it. That was the end of any discussion of what had happened in the previous 20 years. He forgave me. He let me back in his life. We became very close. We spent a lot of time talking over the next seven years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And over the course of these conversations, I started to doubt whether he was the person who picked up Jimmy Hoffa for a whole bunch of reasons. I didn't have any evidence, and I didn't know anything about the case, but just the way he talked about it and the way he revered Hoffa. And so I said to him one day about seven, eight years ago, I said, why don't I write a book about this? I said, I'm sure whatever I find, whatever I discover about what happened in the Hoffa case, that it's got to give you a fairer shake than you've been given because every book that had been written had had him driving Hoffa to his death. That's the, the conventional wisdom. And so I... He hesitated. He hesitated at first. I thought he would jump at this to have me write a book book about his life with Hoffa and a book that tried to vindicate him from the charge that he drove Hoffa to his death. And let me just say, he was like this with Hoffa. Hoffa was a father figure to him. So he was basically being charged with patricide. And it was this terrible... And this charge that was floated in the 70s and his conventional wisdom everywhere... Is, it ruined his life for a whole bunch of reasons. It, it dishonored him. It ruined his life in the Teamsters Union. And it just basically destroyed him. Um, and he tried to fight back, and he could never fight back. He didn't have the rhetorical or financial or legal tools to even confront these charges. So I told him I would do my best to try. He finally came around and said, okay. I said, just one condition. I'll write this book. I'll do my best. I'll try to clear you. I'll try to figure out what happened. And I'll write the best book I can, but I do this on one condition. You have to tell me the truth. He looked at me with his eyes askance. This was a major challenge because Chucky, I learned when I read what's something called the Hoffex Memorandum. I didn't need to read the Hoffex Memorandum. The Hoffex Memorandum was the early FBI report about the case, and it referred to Chucky as all of his friends say he's a notorious pathological liar. I didn't need to, I knew this. He, he always shaded the truth about everything. So that's one set of challenges. That my, my main witness that I'm trying to clear is, an un, is unreliable. Another challenge was there's so much misinformation built up about the Hoffa disappearance over the years, mostly based on the early 1970s theories. So many claims and counterclaims that sifting through that to try to get to the truth it, it, was, it was extremely difficult. Spent seven years doing it, talked to every FBI agent who ever worked the case who was alive, became friends with many of them. I looked at thousands of pages of government documents, many of which have never been discussed in, in public about the case. And, um, and Chucky and I developed a rapport. We spent cert- probably thousands of hours, more than a thousand certainly, uh, talking about the case. And... It was this amazing dance where I was the, the, the interrogator and he would sometimes answer me straight, sometimes not answer, usually try to deflect. But over time, he told me quite a lot. Not everything, but quite a lot. To make a long story short, I, I, in the book, I do believe that uh, I accomplished my original goal. I accomplished my original goal of clearing him from the charge that he was the person who drove Hoffa to his death. I think everyone who's read the book, I hope you agree if you read it, has, has agreed with that conclusion. Uh, 
There are lots of reasons I won't go through them. The circumstantial case against him is full of holes. There was lots of evidence that the government uh, didn't talk about or didn't know about early in the case that developed to suggest he didn't or couldn't have done it. The most salient piece of evidence for me was that the FBI, starting in the 1990s, believed that Chucky was not the person who drove Papa to his death. This is not known in public. Uh, And they had all sorts of good reasons for that, and I talk about this in the book and why they came to the conclusion that Chucky was not involved, in part because they developed an alternate theory of the case. The case, as it's known in the public today, is much different from the case that the government understands today. All of this is talked about in the book. So the book is in part about my journey, kind of a journey of atonement to try to clear Chucky Along the way, and I think I succeed in that, but along the way, fortunately or unfortunately, it turned into something much more than that. It turned into a narrative about the rise of labor in the 20th century, which was which Hoffa represented, and the decline of labor, which he also represented, the rise of the mob in the 20th century, and the decline of the mob, which was closely connected to Hoffa's rise and fall, uh, and the things and the steps that the government took to both diminish labor and to try to diminish the mob. And it's a fascinating story uh, that has really hasn't been adequately told, in my opinion. I do my best to tell it. Along the way, I also learned a lot about law enforcement um, and the FBI. As I say, I became very close with some of the early FBI agents, the four original FBI agents on the Hoffa case who were in their early 30s, The man who originally accused Chucky of doing this, um, uh, we became friends. We spent 12 sessions together, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours talking about the case, going over the evidence. They've never stopped obsessing about it. No one who's ever worked about this case has ever stopped obsessing about it. I don't think Dan has stopped obsessing about it. None of the FBI agents have stopped obsessing about it. They still talk about it, try to think about it. They're still involved in trying to solve the mystery. But I also learned about pretty extraordinary law enforcement abuses. Um, And the the government did not treat Chucky well. Chucky was a man who was not an angel. He he was definitely not an angel. Uh, And there were good reasons, as I say, for the government to suspect him. But it turns out that the public narrative that the government leaked on Chucky didn't match up at all with what the government knew inside. They were constantly exaggerating in the press through leaks the evidence they had against him to try to get him to talk. They were constantly portraying him as the person who did it to try to get him to talk, to try to pressuring him to, into talking in the hopes either that he would be feel pressure by that or he would feel pressure by the mob. They were constantly telling him the mob was going to come after him if he didn't fess up. Um, after the government figured out that he wasn't the person who did it, the government, uh, they never corrected the record. There's a mechanism for leaking allegations and putting it out there. And for 45, 44 years, he's been accused in the public eye of this thing. There was a mechanism for that. There's no mechanism for putting that genie back in the bottle. And uh, it's just not, it, there's no incentive in it for the government to do that once it's out there. There's every incentive for them not to. And then most extraordinarily, in 2013, the government approached Chucky. I approached them. They approached Chucky. And they offered to actually send him an exonerating letter to confirm that they didn't believe he was a target or a suspect in the case. All he had to do, they said, is to come in for an interview, tell the truth, and he would get this letter. Chucky was a very old man. We went to Detroit, went to the interview in the U.S. Attorney's office. He spent four hours with them. It was actually a hilarious interview. He had everybody in stitches. He told the truth about everything, and they agreed that he told the truth about everything. And they promised the letter, and two or three weeks later, they said the letter was coming. And then it was a month, and then it was two months, and four months, and six months, and then the letter never came. And the letter never came because the political people at the top, the U.S. attorney and the head of the FBI, all the people who had worked the case for decades, the assistant U.S. attorney, the FBI agents in charge of the case for decades, were convinced for a whole bunch of reasons that I talk about in the book that he didn't do it, but they didn't give him the letter. They reneged. So, and I tell the story of that. And it's a story, poor Chucky, every every turn, I mean, he's had bad luck most of his life. The book also, as I said in the introduction, it's also a history because this intersected very much with Hoffa's life and my life. It's a history of the American surveillance state. Uh, 
Uh, I spent a lot of time going through these extraordinary illegal transcripts of recordings of illegal bugs in the early 1960s and late 1950s of the mob. And it's a story that's a familiar story. It's a story of the FBI engaging in illegal bugging with what Chucky referred to as backup, i.e. the Justice Department wrote memoranda in secret saying it's okay. Familiar story. And they were extremely unconvincing opinions. They were terrible. But this practice went on for decades, and it reached its height in the early 60s. It finally leaked out. There was reform. I tell the story of that. But most extraordinarily, that story of that round of government excess and surveillance tied up in lots of ways that I don't have time to tell you with my experience in the government with Stellar Wind. In three or four different ways, there was a connection between what Hoffa went through and what I, what I was doing in the government 50 years later. Finally, just a couple more things about the book. The book has many themes. Um, uh, I'll just talk about two more, two more of them, and I'll stop. One is there are lots of historical ironies that I talk about. The book, as I said, is about the mob and, and labor and their relationship over the course of the 20th century. And there are lots of interesting historical ironies that took place. Bobby Kennedy, who went after uh, Hoffa very, very aggressively, crossing several lines, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, um, he thought that he was going to get rid of Hoffa and save the American labor movement and to save the Teamsters members from this horrible person at the top of the union. I can assure you that the members of the Teamsters union who were doing great under Hoffa trusted the working class Hoffa much more than the, the, the preppy millionaire who, as Chucky said, never did a real day's work in his life. But the irony was that in his super aggressive attacks on Hoffa, he painted, Bobby painted with a hugely broad brush. I'm talking about the McClellan Committee, for those of you who know about it. He painted with a broad brush that stained all of labor, and the meme about labor corruption really got going in the late 50s and 60s. You can see it dropping in public approval of unions over the time that Kennedy was going after Hoffa. So that's one historical irony. Another historical irony is Kennedy was convinced, Bobby Kennedy was convinced if he can get rid of Hoffa, decapitate Hoffa from the top of the Teamsters Union, that will get rid of the mob influence in the Teamsters Union. Exactly the opposite happened. Hoffa did dealings with the mob, but he also kept them at bay. He was in charge, and especially with regard to the pension fund. When he went away, his very weak successor, Frank Fitzsimmons, let the mob take over. So actually decapitating Hoffa led to much greater mob infiltration of the Teamsters Union than, uh, than it happened before, something that also Kennedy did not expect. The third irony is the mob had taken over the Teamsters. Hoff was trying to get it back. And it was really the mob's decision to knock off Jimmy Hoffa in 1975 that finally, and I tell this story as well, finally led the government with some tools Congress had given it in the late 60s and early 70s to get its act together, to have the resources, to act, and, and to discover when they, they put massive resources on the Hoffa case. And in the course of that, these amazing memos, in, internal Justice Department memos, when they talk about my God, we've uncovered labor racketeering and mob connections in between the mob and the Teamsters as if uh, the McClellan Committee never existed. It's much, much worse than we realized. And this is the time, starting with the Hoffa disappearance, that led the government to get together the resources and the tools to really aggressively go after labor racketeering and fairly successfully, wouldn't say wipe it out, but diminish it significantly. And so the mob miscalculated. As I quote one of the FBI agents in the case, if Jimmy Hoffa were still on the street, uh, there would be a lot more mobsters still on the street. Finally, and briefly, I'll just say that the book is about, um, and this is the hardest topic to summarize, so I'll just close here. It's about fathers and sons and treachery between fathers and sons, sons and fathers, loyalty and forgiveness. Jimmy Hoffa lost his father when he was seven years old. His father died. Chucky lost his father when he was seven years old. His dad took off and uh, because he had trouble with the mob in Kansas City. Uh, my father left me when I was seven years old. We were all little boys in search of stability. Hoffa never had a, a real father figure. He, was, he did it on his own. Chucky's father figures were Jimmy Hoffa and Anthony Giacalone, a senior mob leader in Detroit, who themselves were very close. And Chucky lived and revered both men but Giacalone was the person that was behind, uh, at least involved in Hoffa's disappearance, and Chucky was caught in that vice. Uh, 
And to make matters worse, of course, he was seen as treacherous because he was seen as the person who uh, killed his father, essentially, or had his father killed. Which, um, And then finally, about my relationship with Chucky, and the book is basically about, in addition to everything else, about my changing views about Chucky over the different stages of my life and how he looked when I was 20 because of how I looked when I was 20 and my perspectives then and how it looked differently after I'd been through the incredible fire of my job in the Justice Department and then how it looked even more different after 10 or 12 years more talking to him as he got very old and near death and I'm getting pretty old too and the book's a reflection on that and some of the complications in our relationship but really in the end about how all of this brought us much, much closer than we'd ever been before. So that's what the book's about. It's about lots of things and I'm very happy to take your questions. I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. It was, it was a good read. My question is, you talked a lot about how um, Chucky had, I forgot the name of it, but he had, had this idea of not talking about everything. Omerta. Omerta? Omerta. Yeah. Do you think if he would have told everything he knew that he would have gotten that letter? I think it was from Barbara McQuaid. McQuaid. No. Oh, so just to be clear, he answered every single question that the government asked him. They were asking him questions about his involvement in the disappearance. They wanted to clear him because they hoped if they cleared him, this was their theory to me and to him, that he would cooperate in telling them what he knew about the disappearance, the other things he knew. Yeah, yeah. So he told them, he answered all of their questions completely fully, and he, he, he satisfied every condition that they, every question that he asked. Um, I don't, I mean, he told me a lot of things later. They didn't ask him these questions. They didn't ask him what he knew about all these other collateral things because there's no way he's going to answer that until he gets off the legal jeopardy hook, which he was on. Um, a big part of the book, I didn't mention this, Chucky was half Sicilian, half Irish, but he was raised with what he calls Sicilian values. He came, his mother came from Kansas City crime family, and his mother schooled him on Omerta, the Code of Silence. Uncle Tony Giacalone, uh schooled him on the Code of Silence. And he, this was the most important principle in his life, and it kept beating up against his desire to help me write this truthful book that he knew I needed to write. And a lot of the book is about our struggle to work through his commitment to Omerta and my commitment to figuring out everything he knew. And it was a struggle right to the very end, as I talk about in the book. First, thank you for being here and putting the stuff about fathers and sons in the book, which didn't have to be in there. You could have told the story without it. It's really emotionally a great thing. Thank you. I have one quick question and one longer question. Quick question. You were living in Arkansas when your mom met Chucky O'Brien, and how did that happen? Yeah. And then the second part is, uh, I Paint Houses, I think the name of the book is, uh -huh. um, where the uh, the guy who's, he didn't write it, but he told it to a reporter, um, says that basically he was the one who killed Hoffa. Yep. And what do you think? Do you think he's being tr he's dead now, but do you think that was truthful yep. or no? So I'll answer those two questions, but I want to comment on the first thing you said. Yeah. So the book is about fathers and sons, and it's really about, um, about a lot of things about fathers and sons, but it's also about forgiveness mm. and the power of forgiveness. And I didn't realize what an important theme this was. I just wrote the book for what I, I thought was important about my relationship yeah. with Chucky and what I learned about that. But the main comment, main feedback I've gotten from dozens now of men, all men was thank you for writing this book because it made me realize issues I have in my family with my parents and the importance of forgiveness in those relationships. And so I'm just, that's the most surprising reaction to the book is that people appreciated that and were helped by it. On your questions about uh, West Memphis, so I, my Chucky was living in Detroit, and my mom was actually living in Florida, but with, with she has three boys. I was the oldest, but my grandmother lived in West Memphis. That's where I was raised. So we happened to be there that summer. She had met Chucky through Chucky's mother, who was a very consequential woman, amazing woman in, in labor and mob circles. And uh, so... Basically, Chucky was in Detroit. Brenda was in West Memphis, my mom. They got married, and then they moved to Florida. As for the book, uh, there's a movie coming out by Martin Scorsese about Hoffa called The Irishman, which is based on a book called I Heard You Paint Houses. Uh, 
And the book is based on a confession of Frank Sheeran, uh, who was uh, a Teamsters official and uh, a hitman, or at least a, 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 crim- a, a serious criminal. And Sheeran uh, gave a confession that turned into the basis of this book, which has now been made into a motion picture. And the confession is, to, to use a technical term, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a long essay in the New York Review of Books, and uh, there's more to say about it. But there's absolutely zero evidence to support it, no evidence at all to support the confession, and lots of reasons to think it's false. Every person I talked to in the FBI gave me lots of good reasons why there was no way Sharon did it. But it's a very cleverly written book, and now it's the basis for a motion picture. So, And most importantly for me, so she, the, the book is basically based on the early 1970s theory of the case that everyone right. knows about and writes on. And he has Chucky drive. I mean, I haven't read the seen the movie yet, but in the book, he has Chucky picking up Hoffa because that's what the conventional right. wisdom was. He just inserts himself into that. So I fear, I'm sure the movie, I, I suspect that the movie has Chucky driving him to his death. And uh, I, I, I suspect that the Scorsese movie is going to be more influential than my account of what the FBI now thinks and the reasons for it, which is unfortunate. Thank you so much. Um, I can't help but wonder how this grenade landing in the middle of your family of the Hoffa events affected the other members, like your brothers and your mother. Thank you. Um, So my brothers and I were very young. I I was 12, my brothers were seven, and um, I was 12, my brothers were eight and five. They were very young, and it was traumatic for all of us, and we all dealt with it in different ways, but the person who was most devastated by it was my mom. She had mental health problems before this event, and they got significantly worse as a result of uh, the investigation, the publicity, the charges, the constant reporters, the stress, being called before the grand jury, which she actually didn't have to attend because of her mental health problems. It had a devastating effect on her. As for me, this is, seems strange and implausible. It was a wild time, but the main thing I remember about those five years, this is, seems impossible, was happiness because of my relationship with Chucky. We were extremely close, and I had a pretty good experience in high school. He went to all my sports events. We did everything together. I don't remember it, and I'm sure I've suppressed a lot. I don't remember it as a terrible time in my life. I remember it as an improvement in my life and as a stable and happy time in my life. It was not good for my mom, though. It was terrible for her. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Again, thank you for your interesting story. Thank you. Um, It's a small point, I guess, but um, I was wondering, how is it that Chucky was able to get uh, information about that information that turned out to be truthful about uh, the government surveillance of of himself and of others. He, he, this well, he, was something you were skeptical of at one point in your life yeah. and then came to realize was true. Right. But you had inside information to learn that it was true. He didn't. So. No, no that's, that's not accurate. I'm sorry if I misled you. So there was, starting in the late 50s, when Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, finally became adva- convinced for a whole bunch of reasons in the late 50s that he had to take organized crime uh, seriously. His first line of attack was to use mostly bugs, sometimes uh, wire surveillance, to gather intelligence on mob figures. And this started in the late 50s, and it went through 1965 or so. It was not known at the time. It was secret. But it all came out in the 60s. And indeed, the reason Chucky knew about it is because the government disclo- when the government revealed all this illegal activity, the Supreme Court ordered them basically to say, well, what are you going to do? They had to, they had to confess error to the court. Thurgood Marshall is the Solicitor General. They confessed error to the court. They said what they thought the legal basis was. They said they'd stop doing these things. They presented a plan to the court in which they pledged to the court that they would reveal every case in which there was even close to illegal surveillance and confess error about that. Chucky's case was one of those. He got lucky because of of these leaks about this in the 60s. So he learned about it in the 60s, and that was the basis for his his conviction being vacated. More generally, one of the many things I learned in writing this book was – 
know, we live in an era of surveillance paranoia, and there's every reason to be paranoid, not just because of what the government's doing, but mostly just because everybody's watching all the time. There are sensors on everything. There was dramatic paranoia in the early 60s. There was story after story after story about the newfangled recording devices that were around every corner and that were watching us and storing the data. It's, it, it, it sounds very much like what we talk about today. And Hoffa had lots of reasons to think that he was being surveilled. The government was very aggressively following him. He believed he was being illegally wiretapped. He was never able to prove it. But the, the short answer to your question is the illegal surveillance came out in the 60s. Chucky learned about it then. He didn't learn about the extent of it. The reason I know about the extent of it is because this is a long story and I'll make short. All of these uh, transcripts from all of these, almost a lot of these illegal recordings from the early 60s are available in public now as part of, believe it or not, the 1980s investigation into the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And they collected all sorts of evidence about the government and the mob. And in the course of doing that, these documents ended up being in the public record. That's how I got access to all of these documents. But Chucky learned about it in the 60s. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I can still remember watching uh, Senator McClellan and, and Bobby Kennedy as an extremely tiny person. Uh, do you have any sense or general comment you'd like to say about whether the Teamsters are a force for good or ill in the history of the country? Today or in the history of the country? Well, so, even a little yeah, bit maybe. I'll, I'll talk, I can talk more about the 50s and 60s and 40s and 70s than I can about today. Okay. That's the period I studied for the book and talked about. And it's a, it's a story of tragedy, I think. Um, so it's hard to exaggerate how powerful the Teamsters Union was in the 50s and 60s. And they were powerful because Hoffa basically expanded the bargaining unit to the national level. And that meant that he could, by closing down transportation routes and failing to deliver or failing deliveries to happen at crucial strategic points, he could put economic leverage on anyone. And this is before... Uh, and, and the government tried to clamp down on this through labor laws, but basically the Teamsters had extraordinary power. Hoffa was extremely successful in, in growing the power of the Teamsters, extremely successful at bringing many hundreds of thousands of workers, many hundreds of thousands out of poverty and into the middle class. He was just very successful at bringing home the bacon for his union and considered narrowly he was good for labor in terms of being good for the Teamsters, at least in that short period of time. Ultimately, however, and there was this promise. I mean, I don't think it was ever a serious promise, but Hoffa was on the outs with all the rest of labor for a whole bunch of reasons, in part because of his commitments. He thought that they were captured by various interests, but in part because he was corrupt. And you know, in a counterfactual world, Hoffa might have led the – if Hoffa didn't have this conventional corruption – in a counterfactual world, he could have led labor in a very different direction. Ultimately, he ended up doing great damage to the labor movement, even though he, because basically his performance at the McClellan Committee was one of it's basically indifference to the corruption and criminality around him. And um, his indifference to those things really just had, a, had a, an effect far beyond the Teamsters in terms of tarring the whole labor movement. So... I mean, it's hard to make very sweeping generalities, but I think on the whole, Hoffa, though a brilliant and very effective labor leader, on the whole, I think his impact has to be seen as negative on balance. And there was a real contrast between he and Dave Beck at the time. Well, Dave Beck was his predecessor, and he was, um, you know, they both, Beck, Beck was his pre the predecessor to Hoffa in the Teamsters Union, and he and Beck had similar tactics. He wasn't as, he wasn't, he used these similar um, similar bargaining techniques that Hoffa perfected. He wasn't the charismatic leader Hoffa was, and he had different kinds of corruption. Hoffa's corruption, I'll just say, Hoffa was always making side deals and always amassing cash. According to Chucky, tens of millions of dollars. There was just cash everywhere, and I believe it for it was confirmed by a whole lot of things I found in my research. But Hoffa wasn't spending it on himself, and he didn't have a fancy life. He was spending it to enhance his power, to buy people off, to buy politicians off, to buy judges off, to buy off anyone who would help him. And he identified his power with Teamsters' power, and that was more or less true. Not completely. Beck was was more more conventionally corrupt in terms of lining his pockets for his, his benefit. Yes. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I haven't read all of your book, just a, a portion of it, and I've scanned some of it. But you had said that while Chucky didn't get the letter to exonerate him, um, you said the FBI did know who did it and who do they say? So I, I, Tony so I can, so um, over the course of many, spending a lot of time with people, with government officials in Detroit, uh, I kind of triangulated and figured out what their current theory is and their current theory of the case for which, which is based on surveillance evidence, conversations that they overheard and informant evidence is that the, um, they think they know who did it. They think that Vito Giacalone, who was the son to the brother of Anthony Giacalone, who was my uncle Tony, uh, was the person who actually picked Hoffa up and they have reasons to think that. And they think that I'm not going to mention the name for reasons I'll explain in a second. They think they know who the person was who actually killed Hoffa. Uh, they caught him on tape bragging about it in a way that was corroborated with some other pieces of information that they had. This corroboration was the basis for the 2013 dig, the last of a dozen digs yeah. to look for Hoffa. Uh, so they think they know the two two, two people that, it, and this person who was a very low level member of the Detroit crime family quickly rose in prominence to the Detroit ranks. I didn't mention his name in the book because for a couple of reasons, and I'm not sure where I should have drawn the line. I didn't mention his name in the book because I don't know what the FBI's evidence is. The FBI's had many theories over the years, and they seem very confident about this theory. I mentioned Vito because he's been conventionally mentioned as a, as a suspect. My publisher wanted me to mention the other name, but I didn't because I found it very frustrating that Chucky was just mentioned as a suspect based on what the FBI thought. And um, that turned out not to be true. And this gentleman is dead. He died. But I just thought that I shouldn't do what I didn't appreciate others doing to Chucky, so I didn't mention his name in the book. But they do think they know. I believe, based on conversations with people in Detroit and the government, that they are going to release this information at some point in the near future. What I was going to ask you is, I think they will ever end. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love the book, and I'm a, a victim of starting with Dan Maldea and yours and Steve Brill and everybody else. Uh, at, at the end of the book, I, I love the book, and I think everybody should read it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, your stepfather does tip his hand a bit and, and indicate that Tony Provenzano was likely involved in it. Right. Is it appropriate to ask you how you think it connects up to the New Jersey uh, mob? Well, so um, Chucky tried hard not to tell me things he wasn't supposed to tell me, but he did tell me some things that he wasn't supposed to tell me. And one of the things he told me was that Tony Provenzano, who was a Teamsters official in the New Jersey Teamsters and a member of the Genovese family, I think, was, as has been widely suspected since 1975, involved in the, uh, in the organization of the plot. And he didn't give any details, but he told me this in an extremely credible way that it was corroborated by a few things. And again, it's not surprising that Tony Pro, Uncle Tony, when I was growing up, <laughs> that it's not surprising that Uncle Tony was involved. It, but Chucky's corroboration, I think, is an important point. Um, it seems pretty clear to me, based on what I learned from Chucky and what I've learned from others, that the Hava hit was approved by the commission, the New York Commission in New York. This was a a decision that affected the whole nation, everybody. Uh, because Hoffa was threatening to take everyone down and there were going to be consequences for everyone. So it was the decision made there. Tony Pro, for a variety of reasons, was on the outs with Hoffa. And I think he was the basically the intermediary between the commission. And this is my speculation. Chucky didn't tell me this, but it's informed speculation. And Detroit, especially Anthony Giacalone, uh, there's a lot of metadata information which hasn't been fully explored in public showing communications between Giacalone and Provenzano which look very much like because of the of the intensity and the dates and some of the other calls they made looks very much like uh, Pro was working with Giacalone. So that's that's the basic contours of the conspiracy at the 40,000 foot level. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Professor Goldsmith, thank you for coming, and thank you for this wonderful book. And to follow on the last question, I have just one question remaining after reading your book carefully. Uh, 
Whatever happened to Tony Provenzano's pool table? <laughs> That's a great question. So, Tony Provenzano's pool table. Uncle Tony, Tony Provenzano was, as Chucky said in the book, the most uncontrollably violent man I met in my life. Uh, and he had some other descriptions <laughs> as well. And Provenzano was, um, but that's not the Tony Pro I knew. The Tony Pro I knew when I was growing up was this kind gentleman who was always in a bathing suit in his Hollandale home where we would often go to hang out at the pool and have barbecues and play on his gorgeous pool table. He had this gorgeous wooden pool table. And I was 13 or 14 then, and I was really into pool, and I loved that pool table, and I asked him where he got it and where I could get one. And one day, Tony, Uncle Tony called up Chucky and said, come over here and get this goddamn pool table and give it to your children, which Chucky did. And we had this beautiful Tony Pro pool table in our garage in Jacaranda in Plantation, which I adored throughout my high school years. And I don't know what happened to the pool table. I have to say, if I had understood the significance of the pool table yeah. when I was 17, I would give anything to have that pool table now. But I don't know what happened to it. I think about Tony Pro every time I play pool. <laughs> Anybody else? Let me echo everyone else's comments. Absolutely amazing book. Um, the question I had uh, uh, kind of goes to the the conversation you had with uh, Chucky. I think it was Applebee's or one of those kind of roadside restaurants. Seasons fifty two. Seasons fifty two, um, where he you know reveals a lot more than he's supposed to. Uh, but it sounded unlike most other conversations you had with him. He tried to retract a lot of that. Yeah. And so toward the end of the book, you talk a little bit about sort of your internal struggle about how much of that to publish. Yes. Um, and I guess we'll we'll never know exactly how much of that you did publish because we don't know what you didn't publish. Uh, but um, I guess the question is, you know, kind of talk through, you know, that because it, it felt in the book a little bit uh, inconclusive where you sort of laid out the case for both sides, but then never really resolved it one right. way or another, kind of like a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Which I, which I am. So let me set, the, let me explain what uh, was just asked for, so everyone can understand. So I learned a lot from Chucky over our many, many, many hundreds of hours of conversation. And even when, and he, as I say, he was always torn. He always had his mother's visage in his in the back of his head. Every time he got close to telling me something, he said, "My mom's looking at me. I can't say that." And but he wanted to tell me things, and but he kept holding back. And I wasn't. I really wasn't. I didn't push him because I actually came to respect his. I mean, it seems bizarre, but I came to admire this important principle for him because it was basically all he had left at the end of his life. He'd lost everything else. But he still told me a lot, even while not sort of confessing everything. And then one day, my mom had had a heart attack. And I came down to see her in Boca Raton, and Chucky was there in the hospital. And he was in much worse shape than my mom. My mom was going to do okay, but Chucky was distraught about her. So my mom said, take him to lunch at Seasons 52, and the food will calm him down. This is a point in my conversations with Chucky when I had basically decided I wasn't going to press him anymore. He told me what he was going to tell me, and I was going to write the book. We sit down at Seasons 52, and I just reflexively hit the voice, the recorder on my iPhone because in all of our conversations, I just always hit the recorder. I had no expectation of having any conversation. And I didn't even, I just did it without even thinking. And so we were talking along, and we weren't even talking, we were talking about my childhood and the good old days when I was Jack O'Brien and the fun things we did. And then somehow the, uh, our trip to Detroit the previous year for this uh, interview with the government came up. And I just said, without even just, just to be talking, I said, you know, those guys think that Tony Pro uh, was involved. And I know you don't think that, but they think they, they're pretty clear that he and, and Anthony Jacqueline were involved. And Chucky said, Tony Pro had a lot to do with it. And I was stunned. I was stunned because he never, ever had talked about, he said it in a way that was very credible, and he had never talked about Tony Pro's involvement in the disappearance, and he'd always given me these stories, which I didn't believe about how he wasn't involved. And he looked down in his soup, and he proceeded for about 40 minutes to tell me a whole bunch of things. <laughs> 
and I learned a lot in that conversation. Uh, and a lot of what's new in the book about the Hoffa disappearance, I learned in that conversation. And it was when I realized a lot of things. It was in that conversation that I realized that Chucky, and I didn't explain this, but the moment Hoffa disappeared, Chucky was in this vice. He was not involved, but he knew a lot about the backdrop. He knew a lot about the Teamsters' relationships with the mob. He knew all the players involved. He immediately knew what happened and why. And so when all this pressure from the government was coming down on him, the government, the, the mob was worried that Chucky was going to break and flip. So he had to be very careful about what he said. He had to get permission for every time he talked to the government. I came to understand the incredible pressures he was under. But he also told me a lot about the background, not to what happened that afternoon. I don't believe he knows what happened that afternoon. I don't believe they told him. He told me they didn't tell him. And he said he's glad he, they, they didn't tell him. And he said he doesn't know, want to know what happened. But he told me a lot of things that he, and one of the many reasons that I, I found it credible that day, and I came to find it credible because as he immediately regretted telling me what he told me. I didn't even, he told me this because he was distraught. And he was, I don't, I don't know why he told me. He was distraught about my mom, and he was distraught, and he was exhausted, and he just downloaded. And I, at that point, this was a very important point in the writing of the book. At that point, I had a huge dilemma for and the dilemma was, wow, I just learned a lot of things that go to the truth of a lot of things about the Hoffa disappearance that is not known and it's credible, and I can't write this book if I can't include this information. That's just crystal clear to me. Um, on the other hand, but then Chucky, a couple of weeks later, had a, basically a meltdown and said, you can't put that stuff in the book. And it wasn't because he feared for his life, it became clear, it because it would violate his honor. He told me something he wasn't supposed to, and he made this very clear to me. And I struggled and struggled with what to do, and my plan was, because I basically said to my publisher, I can either not write the book, I can't write the book without this information, or I can wait until Chucky passes away. And that was my plan. I was going to, because, and yet I, I wanted to exonerate him or show the world that he didn't do this terrible thing, but I didn't want to stay in his honor in the process so, but I, my, my, the way I had done it was I wasn't going to publish the book until he passed away. Well, because of the Scorsese movie, Chucky uh, was very anxious for me to publish the book because he wanted the world to know that he didn't, in fact, drive Hava to his death despite this movie. And he was putting a lot of pressure on me to publish it. And so I decided time was running short. I said, okay, I'm going to let him decide. And I showed him the manuscript, which included... Uh, these things he told me, not every single detail, but much of what he told me, which I found to be material. And I was going to let him decide, let him make the trade-off about what he valued most. I go down to Boca Raton, Florida. I gave him the manuscript on a Monday. I say I needed it back by Friday. My publisher has to know that day whether we're going forward. Over the course of that tense week, I was sure he was going to say, you can't publish this. I saw him looking at the manuscript. He was wincing a few times. He asked me to take a few things out, completely non-material things, but just the stupidest little things. Please take that out out of respect for Barbara Hoffa or whatever. But the meat of the things he told me that he might regret was at the end of the book. And I saw him flipping through to the end, of course, and seeing what happened. Friday comes around, and I say, I have to know. If you want me to publish the book or not, your call. And he handed me the manuscript with a terribly sad face. And he said... I read every word. He wrote a great book. Congratulations, son. And I thought, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> because I don't think he read the book. I don't think he read to the end. And I don't know why. Um, I don't know if it was because it was too painful. I don't know if it was because he didn't want the responsibility for it. I don't know if he decided to suck up his honor so that I could publish this book, which I thought was important. Or I don't know if he decided clearing my name is more important than this. But he gave me the thumbs up. And um, I reflect at the end of the book in a way that I can't really reproduce here, but I reflect at the end of the book about, was I thinking about Chucky? Was I thinking about me? What was the right call? Did I do the right thing? And it, it was a very, very, very tough decision. Um, I can report now that he is not well. He's near the end of his life, I fear. But he is very pleased with the book. He... Um, He's struggled with it in various ways. I was, it's a very candid book, and I talk about my warts and his and lots of other people's. As I say, I tried to write an honest book. But um, the week it was published, he, he had basically not talked to me about it. 
it was very concerning to me because I wrote the book for him and I feared if he hated it, then I failed. And um, basically, uh, he called me up a couple of days after the book was published. I had given him a copy of the book a couple of weeks earlier and he was in tears, and, which he doesn't often do. And he basically said, I've read the book three times. I really read it this time. You wrote an amazing book. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you figured all that stuff out. You got it exactly right. I'm terribly sorry I was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> and that, for me, made it worth writing the book because I really do think that I cleared his name from this. It was a very difficult call about what to put in. I still don't know if I made the right call, but that judgment by him, for me, made it all okay. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>